So I'd guess by the number of people here that, that uh, the assumption is that there's no longer lectures. So um, what's the feeling? Do you, I mean, I want to talk a little bit about stepper motors today, uh, a little bit more about uh, the final project. <clears throat> but shall we call it the last lecture, move to the lab? Sure. OK, then. As of Friday, well, no, no lecture after today. And uh, we'll uh, just run straight through every Monday, Wednesday, and Friday as long as we can in lab. Now, I would guess for the first two or three weeks, it's going to be quiet. But remember that even though there is nothing due, you are still expected to be in your lab full time in your assigned lab every week. I bought, uh, I replenished uh, some of our power electronics. LM386 is a very nice one watt audio amplifier. So I just, I just bought a hundred of those. <clears throat> it really is much nicer than trying to build your own audio amplifier out of, out of discrete uh, transistors and op amps. <clears throat> and one watt of audio is enough to blow you out of the room if you're using fairly efficient speakers. I bought some ULN2003 motor drivers. These are eight channels of NPN switch. So these are eight channels. So eight NPN low side switches and for instance as we're going to see with a with a stepper motor where you have some motor coil what you would do would be to say put the center tap of the coil to V plus and then use a low side switch to ground on each of two phases to get reverse motion. So you, get, you use low side switches a lot for, for motor control. And I bought some L, it's L293D, 293D H bridges. These are um, P dip. P-dip H bridges with the D means it has suppression diodes built in. <coughs> and the H bridges are good for about um, half an amp per phase. So you can, uh, you can use these for lots of small motors. You can, and I believe that they're parallel, they can be paralleled for more current. So can these guys. The transistors can be put in parallel for more current. These are about a half an amp per transistor also. So power electronics for, particularly for motors, and a very specialized kind of motor called a speaker uh, can be driven by the LM386, which is uh, audio bandwidth. So I want to talk a little bit about motors today. Oh yes, before I do though, small boards, anybody's building small boards? Everybody's building small boards. Any problems with those? They boot? Anybody try that last night? I, asked, I built one last night and asked the TA for a pick and he couldn't find them. So. <sighs> They're in the top shelf of the, of the left hand cabinet. If that happens, Rattle the TA's cage, have them call me. That's why we have each other's cell phone numbers. So, yeah, so the TA's can call me and ask. Don't take no for an answer. Kick him in the shins. Well, don't do that. So build up small boards. I've got, I don't know, 150 picks, something like that. Uh, 
I've been messing around with the serial with a serial driver and uh, there turns out there's all kinds of amusing things you can do with an RS-232 terminal which I've never bothered to explore before but you can oh man that is that's beautiful let me turn off the light. I've, I have to call in a ticket on that display apparently. You can, first of all, I set the baud rate to 38 kilobaud, works great. You can output uh, uh, reverse text. You can output different colors of text. You can make a table. So the, the cursor is here and the cursor position is being controlled absolutely not relatively so that you can write all the parameters in a block and still have the command at the top line so you can do all of this so I think you could probably play Pong on it or Space Invaders if you wanted to go to the trouble but 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 the the serial terminal is sort of generally useful in a number of ways I made a couple of small changes to the Lab 5 write-up, mainly in budget. I realized that nobody's using raw bare microsticks anymore. They're using them only as programmers, so I'm dropping the budget cost to a dollar for a microstick. The big board is 10, small board is 4. Any solderless whiteboard is $6 each. Don't put them in your final design. <clears throat> and those are the main changes. Oh yes, the budget is now I officially at $125 per group. And I didn't make any changes down here except to once again uh, remind you all that Appendix A has to be two sentences long. Any questions on on logistics of Lab Five? So even though we may not use the micro stick in the final end product, the fact that we're using it during this process, we should put it towards our budget. Yeah, it's a, as a programmer. Okay. Yeah. Okay, sure. That's why again I dropped it to a dollar. That shouldn't matter very much. So I wanted to talk more, a little bit more about motors and. What we've used to date is DC motors. You put a voltage on them, they turn. The RPM is more or less proportional to the, to the voltage. The current is more or less proportional to the torque. And, and they're reversible. You can run them forwards and backwards. But there's other kinds of actuators that are available that might be more appropriate for a project. So we've messed with DC motors. And have you all messed with servo motors at one point or another? You messed with the continuous rotation servo motors in 3400. Yes. Have you messed with unmodified servos, which do not run continuously? For those, you can set a, a pulse width is directly proportional to an angle. So you set a pulse width, the motor goes to that angle and stays there. Except for a little bit of noise. It tends to chatter a little bit. So servos are really good where you want to be able to control the, the direction something is, is pointing. Last year I had a group who built a, a laser cannon, so to speak, that would point at a target, use two servos to point at the target and fire the laser at the target. It was constrained only, the target was on the screen of a, of a, of a LCD display and the laser was pointing only at the screen, so it was pretty safe. 
it was pretty accurate too. It, it, it tracked, did a bunch of vision, tracked track the square and, and fired at it. Using servos to position the, the uh, beam. There's a thing called a solenoid, which is a very simple device, but it's a form of linear actuator where you only need really crude actuation, maybe binary actuation. It's a coil and a metal core. You turn on the coil, the core gets pulled into the magnet. Boop, into the magnet. Perfect for door locks, for instance, for electronic door locks, for unpinning the hinge on a, on a, on a bird box if you're trying to capture birds in the bird box for banding studies. These are very nice small range linear actuators, perhaps making a small braille display, for instance, where you could want to poke a few pins up and then pull them down again very quickly. Nitinol wire. Nitinol wire, nit nit it's nickel titanium alloy, and it has the amusing property that when you heat it to 50 C, it shrinks 2% in length. So it's kind of, it has a negative temperature coefficient of, of expansion. And the force it generates is phenomenal. So a wire the size of your hookup wires that you use in the lab will produce maybe 50 kilograms of force. It'll lift you off the ground. And the nice thing about nitinol is that it is quiet. So if you want to do something that requires maybe a small, a sh relatively slow, graceful motion without too much noise, you could use that one year. People made a robot flower, sat there, and you shine a light at it, and it would open up using nitinol wire. And it lasted just long enough for the demo before it caught on fire because they were overpowering the nitinol a little bit. Nitinol is interesting stuff. You say 2% change in length, that's nothing. So how do you get motion? Well, how do you get motion out of your bicep? It only changes length maybe 5%. You use a big lever to get motion using nitinol wire. So nitinol is a, a reasonable actuator, actually. There's also uh, stepper motors which I had a request to talk about, so I'll talk a little bit more about stepper motors. I've used nitinol for a few things, and, uh, but I've used steppers for a lot more. I use solenoids all the time. Servo motors are just everywhere. One of the weirdest things that was done with nitinol was this guy Ayers. Can't remember where he was. He built a robot lobster was about that long and all of the actuators were nitinol wires and this thing would crawl along the bottom of the ocean find cables and cut them want to guess who is funding that EPA, EPA. <laughs> DOD <laughs> and uh, kind of a wacky idea but so stepper motors, so if we compare them, they make rotation typically, although there are linear actuators also. So DC motors, if we compare them, if we compare them, a DC motor is uh, free spinning. The permanent magnet motors that we have, they're permanent magnet internally in the, in the motor housing, on the, on the rotor actually. Uh, hold, has holding torque at zero current. At zero current. So these things produce a small holding torque even if there's no power applied to them. These the DC devices are constant voltage sources or constant voltage uh, requirement. 
steppers are require a pulse train. In fact, they require at least two properly phased pulse trains. DC motors are impossible to position without feedback. Like for instance, a servo has feedback to position. Steppers are digital. As long as you maintain the operating conditions correctly, every time you put a pulse on, you get n degrees of rotation, commonly 15 degrees or 7 degrees or 3 degrees. It goes to a different position and stays there until the next pulse, in which case it goes to the next position. So you can get reasonable ac uh, um, accuracy in positioning with no feedback as long as you don't exceed the torque limits of the motor. You exceed the torque limits of the motor, and torque can be, have, there's, there's two possibilities for too much torque. One is, you got a little motor, you put a big load on it, it spins, and then you don't have reproducibility. If you try and take a motor and accelerate it from zero to full RPM in one pulse, you'll, you'll skip pulses because angular acceleration takes high torque. High acceleration takes, angular acceleration takes high torque. You have to ramp up the velocity of a stepper motor if you expect to have absolute positioning accuracy. But you could do it. One of the, one of the most amusing uh, projects I had was a, a device that rode on Blackboard had a servo motor at the top of the blackboard here. Had a, I'm a stepper motor, a stepper motor here. And it had a string coming down from both of them to a marker. And it was completely open loop. Once you, pr you, you, you spun the wires, and you spun the, the, the motors until you were in the center of the board, you pressed reset. And then after that, the system knew where it was because the steppers didn't lose track of their relative rotation. And this point was dragged around the board by these two servos and drew letters. It's an interesting transform because the natural coordinate system for this system, for this, is a circle around this point if it's being pulled by this wire and a circle around this point if it's being pulled by that wire. So you have to do a Uh, inverse kinematics calculation, you have to solve the Laplacian of the thing. And, uh, but it worked well because the motors didn't slip. So, stepper motors are quite useful for lots of stuff. They are not good, they are not good for high speed. You would not use a stepper motor for a persistence of vision display where you want to rotate the display at 20 revolutions per second or so. You're not going to get to a high enough rotational speed using a stepper motor. For that you want to use a DC motor. So they're not good at high speed. However, they have phenomenal torque at zero RPM. That's where they have maximum torque is at zero RPM. So they'll really twist. Going to the next step. So what's inside one of these things? <clears throat> the general idea is that there are magnetic pole pieces in there. I'm drawing four magnetic poles, but in reality there's more like a hundred per, per revolution. And the pole pieces are driven from two electromagnets. All of the pole pieces are driven from two electromagnets. So these come around. There's a coil wrapped around the, this pole piece. And there's an electromagnet wrapped around the other pole piece. 
how am I going to do this? Hmm. Um, so there's a coil here and a coil here and then in the center is a bar magnet which is free to rotate. So it has a north, so north pole and a south pole. If you actuate this coil so that this is a south pole here on the, uh, on the electromagnet, then this will be a north pole. You have this magnet being held at that position. Now let's say that you turn off this current and you induce a south pole here and a north pole here. That rotor is going to turn 90 degrees. Then you turn that off, you put a south pole here, it turns another 90 degrees, you turn another 90 degrees and you've gone one revolution. So by, by fiddling with the order in which you, you activate the coils, you can make the rotor go forward, backward, stop, hold on a, on a, on a, on a specific position, if you bo make both of these south poles, you're going to get a stable position right there. Halfway between the poles, which in fact is called half-stepping. Sadly, there are at least six different configurations of, of stepper motors in the world and they are typically categorized by how many wires come out of them. And the ones we're going to talk about are four and six wire models. Four wire models have two coils, two wires each. Six wire models have two coils, but they're center tapped. So you have six wires coming out. And typically, when you buy these things, if you buy them surplus, there is absolutely no documentation on them. Yes? How, uh, how accurate is half-stepping? Uh, if there's any like, variation in the electromagnets? So are you saying that it could be a few degrees off? So typically for, the, for a step, for a motor with a step of, of seven degrees, the half stepping would be three and a half degrees. If it's a half a degree off, maybe you care, maybe you don't. But it's fairly accurate. These are rather precise devices. Um, if you turn on both magnets in this configuration, you get twice the holding torque. No, you don't. You use twice the current. Because both of these are activated, you only get square root of two times the holding torque because of the decreased goodness of the geometry. So, so the, two, the two kinds of motors have to be driven differently. For a given weight and size of motor, if you have just two coils here, you're using the whole coil for current, you either put current through it this way for one pole direction or this way for this way for the other pole direction, then you have to be able to flip the current back and forth through this coil which suggests driving it with an H-bridge. Everybody, everybody know H-bridges? Yeah. So if you're willing to, to control the shape of the pulses so they're not binary, you can make this smoothly rotating, in fact. Don't do that. Because then you lose the digital nature of it. You want to make sure that the steps are discrete enough that you can control this as a, as a binary motor and not as a continuously rotating motor. The finer the steps, the less control you have.
But yes, you can, you can microstep these things by changing the phase of the pulses. However, the big advantage of stepper motors is make them binary, make them count. <coughs> so, you know what Nash bridge is? Yes, no, 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 okay. So an H bridge is a device that looks like this. You're going to have a, a switch here, and obviously these aren't going to be mechanical switches in general. They're going to be FETs. They're going to be, in this case, P FETs, and then down here an N FET. And to reverse the current, you close this switch and this switch to get current going this way. You close this switch and this switch to get current going this way through the coil. You close this switch and this switch and what happens? Power supply blows up. So, so you have to be sure that your controller only closes alternate switches at any time to reverse the direction of the current and that means you never do that in software. It is insane to build your own H bridge and it's insane to drive it directly from software. You are going to buy H bridges and use their internal decoders to do this. I've seen many students burn up a whiteboard, melt a whiteboard melt a solderless board by building their own A-Power H-bridges. It's very impressive. Smells kind of interesting. Like, like kind of like it's, like, it's a nylon polymer polyethylene kind of smell. Unless it actually catches on fire. So, so, this, rec the this system requires four transistors per phase. So you'd have two H bridges then to run the stepper motor. And the, uh, uh, the L293D uh, that I mentioned earlier is in fact a, a dual H bridge which is designed to do this. Six wire motors are typically hooked up with V plus going to the center and then you switch one or the other of the phases to ground. So that at any time half of the coil is used which means you don't have as good a weight to performance ratio as you do with a, let's see, one of these is called a, this is called a unipolar motor. And this is called a bipolar motor. So unipolar motors have about half the the magnetic field to coil weight performance of a bipolar motor but they're much easier to they only require four transistors total to switch the four phases so it's half as many transistor switches so one way of 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 doing this then is to have the CPU control which switches are closed and you would typically close one here and then before you open that you close one here then before you open that you close this one then before you open that you close this one so you're going to be stepping back and forth between turning on switches you're going to be staggering the turn on the switches you get the order wrong and the thing sits there and shakes makes the sound shakes 
doesn't actually rotate. You'll know when you get it wrong. If you get it right, then the system will advance one step per rotation. You may not be able to see it, but you can feel it. When you hold, your, hold the shaft, you'll be able to feel it rotate. You'll be able to feel it vibrate and, and click the pulse. <clears throat> Now, so this would be typically four I.O. lines to run a unipolar motor. This would typically be also four I.O. lines because you are not going to decode these switches directly. You're going to use inverters that are part of the, of the H bridge to make sure that these two switches are never closed at the same time. And also, typically, FETs are used as level shifters here so that you don't have to worry about not getting one of the switches turned off completely. <clears throat> so, what does the switching look like? Well, it is a... So if you're using a, a unipolar motor like this, and a lot of them that I buy are unipolar, not all of them, uh, but for, for if, if this is switch one and switch two and switch three and switch four, then uh, a full step rotation might be one, then four, four closed, then two, then three, and then one again. And a half step rotation scheme might be start with one, and then turn on one and four, and then four, and then four and two, and then two, and then three and two, and then three, and then one and three and back to one. So you'd, you'd be able to step smoothly through all of the conditions for a slightly more involved pulse train generation. This is such a, a ritualized static thing to do that people tend to build integrated circuits that that do uh, pulse trains for you. There's a couple of, Allegro makes a, a uh, stepper motor controller. There's a couple of others. The companies tend to come and go though, so I don't know the names anymore. There used to be one that was, what was it? You know, Moose Track hardware or something and uh, they've gone out of business but uh, let me see did I write that down no oh ferretronics that's what it was not moose track it was ferretronics made a device that took in serial commands from a UART and outputted control for for a, uh, a stepper motor that's pretty handy You can, you can also, you would typically energize at least one coil, which is going to pull the motor, snap a motor to that position. Now, f for, for uniformity of torque, you want to have some overlap. So before you turn off this one, you want to turn on this one so there's always current to pull the, the system over to the next state. But, but yes, you're, you're, you're sequentially energizing electromagnets, which is pulling a, a, a permanent magnet around. B 
because these are inductive loads, almost pure inductors, they produce a large LDIDT when you turn them off and you have to have suppression diodes on the transistor switches and almost all H bridges and certainly all of the motor drivers I've been talking about the ULN 2003 and so on and the um, the L293D uh, H bridge have internal diodes for suppression diodes to keep you from blowing up the transistors with the DIDT spike coming out of the motors I'm going to be using a stepper motor. Do you have one now? Well, you have it with you. Wow, I'm impressed. Let's see, what is it? How many wires? Six. Six wires. Have you decoded the wires yet? Nope. So that was that was one in the uh, that was in the in the lab. Yeah. Okay. So. That's a pretty fine one. How many steps? 1.8 degree steps, it says on it. You could, f 2 amps, 1.8 ohms. 1 volt motor? I don't know yet. You, let, you willing to let people feel the, the pulse train in there? Pass it around. Now, you got six wires. How would you figure out how the phases are connected? Huh? Oh, you could do that, yes. Uh, in fact, any of these motors will produce enough voltage to light an LED if you spin it. Because they're, of course, generators also. But, uh, what I would suggest is just use an ohmmeter. You hook up any two wires. You only got six wires. How many, how many things? Six things taken two at a time. Remember that from, what is that? That's six things taken two at a time is six factorial over four factorial, two factorial, right? Isn't that right? Is that right? Six factorial is... 120? Well, the answer is 15. The answer is... 30, divi 30 divided by 2, because the, the 4 factorial cancels out top bottom. So 30 divided Good, okay. <laughs> so there's only 30 combinations, you just go through them all. But, so you're going to pick up any two wires, you get the resistance. It's either going to be infinity or it's going to be finite. If it's finite, you write it down. If it's infinity, you say, well, they're not connected. Then you go through, you take, you keep one wire constant, you take another wire. It's either going to be infinity or it's going to be that value or twice that value or half that value. And from that you can de you deduce whether you're across this part of the coil or this part of the coil or between coils. So you can, you can figure out the wiring diagram for these things in minutes. Now, figuring out which direction to, the pulse train is going to go requires a, a, a test because you don't know which which coil is on which phase of the motor but can you feel the pulse the, the detents on that are very fine but you can feel them in there and that's the holding torque yeah so Getting a, stepping, a stepper motor set up is a little more work, but because they're digital, they're really very nice. They're really good. What are you using it for? We're turning knobs on an edge sketch. Oh, okay. So this is this is going to be connected directly to the <coughs> to the etch -a sketch, probably by direct drive, shaft to shaft, right? And so it needs a high torque motor because the etch -a sketches, or at least the ones I had, were pretty grungy knobs and that that motor should turn them you got the edge sketch too of course he does <laughs> so you can imagine 3d printing a, a shaft coupler or you can buy shaft couplers from 
Do you know, there's this great company, McMaster Car. Do you know this company? Yes. They, I th they, they, they deliver overnight to Cornell. I think that they have a, an outlet, a distribu distribution outlet in Dryden or something. Because you can order 100 pounds of nuts and bolts and they're here the next day. It's great. It's just awesome. They have shaft couplers. You could buy shaft couplers that has a couple of screws on it. You put the shafts together, you know, so it's inch, they're coupled. They even make flexible shaft couplers so that if you don't get the alignment just right, it'll still work without breaking anything. Yeah. What does it mean by two phase? <clears throat> it has it has two it has uh, two two coils. There are motors that have more than two coils, but, but you're not going to see them in this lab. <coughs> Buying a stepper motor new from DigiKey will cause you to cry. They're really expensive. So you want to go to one of these surplus places to buy motors like allelectronics.com or mpja.com. I stopped ordering bulk stuff for the class from mpja.com. That's Marlon P. Jones Associates, whoever they are, because they had long delivery time. Yes. You can also order them on eBay really cheap. You can order them on eBay and you get what you pay for on eBay. They're cheap and worth every penny of it. So, yes, you can get great deals on eBay and you can get shafted on, on eBay. Uh, particularly for semiconductors. Okay. Uh, so, I would never order anything for the course on eBay. Uh, you're welcome to. Remember, there's no documentation. It may matter, it may not. But you're right. Also, sometimes you get good deals on Amazon, which is slightly less sketchy than eBay for electronics. Um, we've, we've bought uh, NRF 24 radios on, on Amazon and worked fine. Although there are some counterfeits of those around. Anybody have eBay stories of stuff that's either worked or not worked that you want to share? Yes? I bought the little 18 mega chips on eBay and also the uh, radio and the eye clicker off eBay. Did it work? Yeah, those all worked fine. Okay. Yeah, it's, it's luck of the draw, right. Yeah. I haven't tested the blue modules yet. Luck of the draw. So, it is a... Uh, Think about actuators. Think about sensors. If you have to sense something, if you have to sense motion, let's say you want to turn a DC motor into a servo motor. How do you do that? Let's say, let's say you need a one horsepower servo motor or something. I, by the way, I know a guy who designs uh, race car simulators. And so you sit in this full-size car and you, if, you, if you spin out, the whole car rotates around its vertical axis, right? And, and the servo motors are about 30 horsepower. It's terrifying. Um, but uh, think about power, think about heat dissipation, think about how you want to actuate. Do you need linear motion? Do you need rotary motion? If you need linear motion, how are you going to make a linear actuator or are you going to buy a linear actuator? Um, if you need a sensor, what are you trying to sense? Anybody going to sense some weird thing? Motion, there's lots of ways of getting motion. What you got there? 
Got leads on it? Yeah. Nice. So, um, um, I've, I've messed around with lots of weird sensors in the, in the various years, including trying to think, do things like instrument the motion of locust wings, um, track millimeter fish in a tank, uh, make an actuator that would, I think I told you, simulate the, the drumming of a ant abdomen on a leaf. Um, don't ask. <laughs> and um, so I might be able to hazard a guess as to how you could set something up if you need to measure something small or, or quiet or move something quickly. Audio speakers are very good at moving things quickly for a small distance. Oh, one thing I didn't mention is piezo. Piezoelectric actuators are extremely high force, small, usually small distance, but extremely fast, megahertz fast. So if you need, if you need to move something a few microns really fast, that's a good way to do it. I had a guy one year build a scanning tunneling microscope in this class. It was the most insane thing everybody, anybody ever proposed that actually worked at the end. He um, could map the position of gold atoms in a gold foil out to MATLAB and he could push atoms around. Built in five weeks. It's totally insane using piezo actuators to move the tunneling tip around on the gold foil. What else? Can you power servos off of a tip or do you have to do separate power servos? Typical servos that you get off of, say, um, a Hobby King, or, or Adafruit would be five volt servos. And so you have to have a separate power supply. They're also remarkably noisy. They produce a tremendous amount of radio frequency interference. So you really need to have a separate battery pack for servos or a separate power supply for servos. I would say for five volt servos, run them off of four A cells, that's six volts, they're typically fine at six volts. They will be destroyed at seven volts, however. You can buy three volt servos. You still need to run them off a separate power supply, uh, partly because the, the regulators that we have on those boards are good for about 200 mils, and typical small servos will peak at about an amp. And so if you start running that off the off the same power supply as the microcontroller, you'll find that the microcontroller browns out and does a reset. Um, can you share a ground? <clears throat> Whether you can share a ground or not depends on how much noise there is. You may need to use opto. A safe thing to do would be to use opto. <clears throat> but if you but if you have to share a ground for some reason, you can probably do it if you do enough filtering. Because, like, I need a, I have feedback coming off of the servo, so, like, I need common ground to, like, read the feedback. Or two-directional opto, which is tedious. You, it's hard to get, a, is it analog feedback? Yeah. Getting analog across an opto link is doable, but you don't want to. There is a, a specific device called an IL-200, which has a very interesting and cool structure. It's an infrared diode and two pin diodes in the same package. So, these are the receiver diodes. 
you use one of these diodes in the input loop as feedback to linearize it and you use the other diode as output. And by using one diode to linearize the other diode, you can make a completely linear opto coupler. Getting that working right requires about a week of work. I used to do this with uh, one of the biomedical engineering classes I taught because isolation is important for human safety in the hospital. The leakage current that will kill you if you have a catheter in and therefore have a direct connection to your heart is about 25 microamps. That's nothing folks. You can get 25 microamps of leakage current dragging your hand along the metal here. So it's quite hard to, to isolate enough to get rid of that. But IL-200, IL I have a few of these left over from the course if you want to mess with them, but don't. Unless you've got lots of spare cycles. What else? All right. Okay, so Friday, Friday, there's no lecture. We're done. Thanks, guys.